The Legend of Zelda. The franchise has basically been around since the creation of video games, or at least when they started to become more than just a couple colors on the screen. And somehow, some way, Nintendo has consistently managed to pump out banger after banger. <laughs> For the most part, anyway. And with the upcoming release of Tears of the Kingdom this week, it's honestly looking to be the same story all over again. It looks so good, in fact, that the entire game has already leaked online and is fully playable. But after what happened to that Bowser guy for selling Switch hacks, I really don't want to know what Nintendo would do to whoever leaked one of their flagship titles. Legal ramifications aside, I really wanted to take this time to reflect on the game that got us where we are right now. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. And what I'm hoping to see from Tears of the Kingdom. Now, for those unaware, Breath of the Wild was released way back in 2017 as a launch title for the Switch, and this game changed a lot. So much, in fact, that certain people questioned whether or not this was even a Zelda game anymore, but I think we can agree that the consensus was pretty good. To provide some context, Zelda games are traditionally pretty linear for the most part, having roughly guided experiences in the order you're supposed to do things. Go here and do this, and then over here and there, you get the idea. Breath of the Wild decided to say, screw it, party like it's 1986 and go wherever the hell you want. You want to rush to the final boss with nothing but your underwear? That's fine, bro, have at it. You want to spend five years exploring every inch of the map to completely trivialize the end? That's fine too, do whatever you want, champ. Breath of the Wild is basically a sandbox action adventure. Is it the first game to ever do something like this? No, of course not, but the way it did it was incredibly refreshing for the medium as a whole, and especially the open world genre in the AAA space. But where do we even begin? Well, the Great Plateau, of course. This has been your home for the last 100 years, and my oh my, it is quite the tourist attraction. Snowy peaks, lush forests, this weird fucking rock thing, dare I say, breathtaking. And this entire zone is just the tutorial. Puzzles to solve, powers to find, things to craft or cook, bosses to fight, there's plenty of variety for you to do here, and it simultaneously teaches you all of the basics of the game without treating you like a toddler. Not to beat a dead horse, but as someone who loves nerding out over design details, I think The Great Plateau is one of the best tutorials in gaming, hands down. But the real kicker? This whole massive region that you could spend hours exploring on your first playthrough is but a minuscule fraction of the rest of the world. And once you've finally conquered this region, felled its mightiest beast, and feel ready to continue to the rest of your journey, you are left with only two words. Destroy Ganon. The game doesn't care how you do it, when you do it, or in what order you do it, just get it done. With nothing but a vague destination and a looming evil at the center of it all, your adventure begins. And honestly, that feeling is absolutely amazing. So amazing, in fact, that From Software did the same thing with Limgrave and Elden Ring, and it was awesome. Elden Ring and Breath of the Wild really are two sides of the same coin, although that could be another video on its own. But bringing it back to Zelda, this sense of wonder really puts a lot of responsibility onto the players themselves. It's up to you to decide your boundaries. When you leave the plateau, some may book it for Kakariko Village, as it's the only real direction you're given. Others may take a keen interest in the desert and head there, or maybe you're one of the people that spotted something massive circling Death Mountain and decided to investigate that out of shock. Are you going to explore every inch of the map? Every town, shrine, dungeon, and then some? Is the journey more important than the destination for you? Or are you only going to focus on becoming strong enough to finish the game? And even then, two people could go about completing the same tasks in completely different ways. Due to the nature of the Sheikah Slate's abilities, puzzles in the game could have more than one solution where in previous Zelda games, most things have a set answer to how you'd finish them. Like I said earlier, none of this is really new to games, but the way it's done is. And it's almost created a new subgenre of open world games in a way. Of course, there are games like Skyrim, which are open world RPGs, but those games play out very differently from one another. If I put Breath of the Wild, Genshin Impact, and Elden Ring next to, say, Skyrim, Fallout 4, and Cyberpunk, I couldn't in my right mind say they were the same type of game. Sure, they're all open world and definitely have overlapping similarities, but it's just a different formula and has a different feel to how they play. Neither is better or worse than the other, it's just a different style. Now, all of this isn't to say that everything Breath of the Wild does is perfect. In fact, there is one core problem that doesn't start to show up until you've spent a good chunk of time in the game. For me, I started to notice it around the 80-ish hour mark of my first playthrough. 
It doesn't ruin the game by any means, but just slightly sours the experience. Everything you do just leads to another shrine. Breath of the Wild has a lot of content. 120 shrines, 4 divine beasts, 900 Korok seeds, plenty of unique NPCs and quest lines to unlock different gear or weaponry, mini bosses, bosses, you name it. But because of the nature of it being open world and doing anything in whatever order you want, almost nothing is progression gated. And you start to realize, almost any cool area or secret you're going to find will inevitably be another shrine. It will always be a shrine. The reward will always be a spirit orb, and you will always get some extra health or stamina out of it. In a vacuum, this isn't a bad thing. For some, it may even be good. But when I started to realize this towards the end of my playthrough, it began to kill a bit of the surprise for me. That massive labyrinth you spotted off the coast to the north? It's just another shrine. Shooting the scales off of a corrupted dragon? That just unlocks another shrine. A long abandoned ruin of a place literally called the Forgotten Temple? Just a shrine. None of this is to say that the shrines aren't good. Far from it, I love their addition and how they're implemented. I just wish there was something else in addition to them. Elden Ring managed to avoid this problem. It doesn't matter where you go in Elden Ring. Anything you stumble upon could be deathly important. You could discover whole ass zones on accident that was just hiding from you randomly somewhere. These can have NPC quests attached to them, secret bosses, unique loot, upgrade materials, shop upgrades, key items for later areas of the game, and then some. Literally nothing is off the table in Elden Ring, and I think that is what it was just barely missing from Breath of the Wild. Now, in previous Zelda games, it wasn't any different either, so I'm not saying that this is a sin that Breath of the Wild has committed that the old games didn't, because in the old games, it was basically pieces of heart bomb bag upgrades. All of your key items were found in dungeons, the open world was just like extra stuff for you to find. But with Breath of the Wild being the open world game that it is, it is a new problem that needs to be fixed. Which brings us to Tears of the Kingdom. Now, I think this game is going to be amazing. I stopped watching footage after the initial showcase of the new abilities, but from what I've seen, I think they are going to crank the sandbox aspect up to 11. Just being able to fuse any item together to create new items with new effects is absolutely insane. Like, I can strap a case eye to an arrow and then make it into a homing arrow? That's ludicrous. Is fusing a piece of raw meat to an arrow also going to have a unique effect? Design like that has a huge effect on replayability and even the social aspect of the game. Sharing stories with everyone and reacting to how someone found something you didn't. In the age of the internet, this is just as important as gameplay. It's fun to share those experiences with others. That's why everybody records themselves playing it, streams themselves playing it, makes shorts of themselves playing it, of funny moments, of crazy things. It matters. Honestly, my only real concern is that the game might experience some performance issues at launch, but hopefully those will be ironed out by now. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a wish list of things I'd like to see in the game. They've been pretty tight-lipped on what to expect from Tears of the Kingdom. The main website for the game basically just goes over the new abilities and a few bits about exploration and vague hooks on the plot. If this were any other game, it would probably be a cause for concern, I admit. But considering this is a sequel to Breath of the Wild, I actually think this is probably for the better. We already experienced Breath of the Wild six years ago. The initial magic from that paradigm shift is over. You know what you're getting into. But the smaller details, how you'll do all these different things, what you'll find, those are still a mystery, and Zelda's track record is strong enough that I have complete faith in them to deliver. And it's clear from the gameplay showcase that they definitely took risks, but I'm also hoping they took more. As far as I'm aware, there's been no official word on what Tears of the Kingdom is doing for the dungeon aspect of the game. At the very least, there's nothing linked on the store page or official website anyway. We have no idea if it will be Divine Beasts, Shrines, Traditional Dungeons, or a mixture of the three, but personally, I'm really hoping it's some sort of hybrid. Breath of the Wild was one of the most fun experiences I've ever had with a game, period. But in areas such as the Divine Beasts, I think they played it too safe. To be fair, the game took a very long time to develop, they were redoing the fundamentals of Zelda, and I think they just kinda wanted to get it over with. But I think the Divine Beasts were too similar to the 120 shrines spread out across Hyrule. And while I don't have a problem with reskinned bosses with different abilities, I think it was a bit underwhelming in terms of what we have gotten in the past. 
Sure, their fights may have been different, but when it's basically the same model with the same boss music, it loses a bit of the magic. Scope and scale is important. So I think I would still love to see shrines, but with several more traditional dungeons taking the place of Divine Beasts. Divine Beasts were cool, don't get me wrong, you had to take the entire beast into account for solving the puzzles, moving the limbs, but it didn't go far enough. Additionally, I really hope the final boss has some more meat to it. Calamity Ganon, at its core, isn't a bad boss fight, but it ends way too early with nowhere near enough challenge. Now, Zelda games have never been hard, don't lie to yourself. Anybody who's played them in the past or has any sort of experience with Zelda titles probably isn't going to die while playing them, not unless you're just not paying attention. Breath of the Wild wasn't brutal either, but it definitely upped the ante in all the different ways you could die. Drowning, burning, running out of stamina, dying in a thunderstorm because you have metal weapons equipped, the list goes on. But the second phase of Calamity Ganon, the ultimate ending to this massive game, was completely and utterly disappointing. Just run around on a horse and shoot light arrows, something that was reserved for the middle point in Ganon's fight in Twilight Princess has now become the final challenge, and it just wasn't a threat at all. So I really hope Tears of the Kingdom is something worthy of a final boss this time around. Aside from that, just more cool shit is honestly enough. Just cool things to find, fight, and do, and I think the game will be perfect. It already looks like the sandbox aspect is going to be a blast, so no worries there. Oh, yeah, and story. I honestly really liked the story of Breath of the Wild, but it took such a backseat to the gameplay that I kind of forgot about it until just now. So, more cool cutscenes and characters, I guess? I liked the cast of Breath of the Wild a lot, or, well, everybody except Yunobo and Rivali. Rivali was meant to be an asshole on purpose, but Yunobo was just kind of annoying, if I'm being completely honest. Other than that, no real complaints from me. At the time of writing this, there's currently less than 24 hours until Tears of the Kingdom releases, and I absolutely cannot wait. I wanted to get this video out much sooner, but procrastination is a bitch. Anyway, I'll be streaming my full playthrough over on my second channel. I do not currently have a time for that, as I have to wait for my physical copy to arrive on Friday, but definitely keep an eye out, and there will always be the VOD if you missed it. But thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment, subscribe, whatever suits your fancy. It really motivates me to keep going. Stay positive, friends, and I'll catch you in the next one.